All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the latest episode of Scrubbing the Skies, uh, the webinar series of the Institute for Responsible uh, Carbon Removal at American University. As always, I'm your uh, host, uh, Will Burns, and uh, thanks for all of you who uh, are, are attending this webinar or uh, see it uh, in the in the future. Now, one of the major issues uh, for both the uh, those that uh, seek to utilize carbon capture and storage for point sources of uh, of of capture, as well as for many of the technologies that we discuss in the carbon removal industry, including BAX and direct air capture, is the uh, regulation of the storage of carbon dioxide. Because we all know that while some carbon dioxide ultimately may be utilized in products or uh, may be uh, 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 captured utilizing uh, processes such as uh, carbon mineralization, the lion's share of carbon that is removed in, a, in the carbon removal process or the CCS process is ultimately going to have to be slated for storage, most of it uh, terrestrial, at least in terms of the United States. Uh, the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, has a regulatory uh, framework in place for doing this. Uh, and But one of the things that it's encountered in the, the last year as interest has grown in carbon capture and storage as well as carbon removal is a, is a, is a daunting backlog of applications, which ultimately could slow down the development of these industries and obviate the kind of scaling that uh, we believe is necessary. As a consequence, there's been increasing emphasis, especially in the last year, on the issue of, of primacy, whereby the EPA can accord states the uh, legal and regulatory authority over these underground injection programs for so-called class six wells. Uh, while this potentially could help facilitate uh, 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 reducing that backlog, it could at the same time pose some serious questions as to whether states have the competency uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the political uh, will uh, to ensure integrity and environmental protection. And, uh, and as a consequence of this, uh, uh, thought leaders in this area have started discussing those very issues. And we have two of them today who are uh, authors of a, a new uh, uh, issue brief uh, that uh, uh, has... Uh, uh, has been released by the National Wildlife uh, Federation. And so first of all, I want to introduce our guest today. Uh, first of all, uh, Jake uh, Farrell, who is a Carbon Removal Justice uh, Fellow for the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, welcome, Jake. As well as uh, Dr. Simone uh, Stewart, who is the Senior Industrial Policy Specialist at the National Wildlife Federation. And welcome to you also, Simone. And so, uh, as is true with our usual format, uh, we'll start with an initial intervention that will uh, uh, summarize the uh, the study, uh, and then uh, we will move to uh, a couple of questions by myself to seed the conversation, and then we'll move to your questions. So I'd like to encourage you, as the uh, uh, initial uh, presentation ensues, uh, that you start to populate the Q&A box uh, with your questions, and then we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. And so with that, I would like to uh, turn the uh, floor over initially to Simone. Thanks so much, Will, for that introduction. And thanks for everyone uh, joining us today. We'll be sharing a presentation that will go over, as Will said, um, it will be split between uh, Jake and I, and uh, then we'll be happy to take some questions from everyone. So thanks so much for starting us off. Jake, if you wanna go to the next slide. So I just want to start with a broad overview um, as kind of what Will gave about the necessity of carbon management and why NWF and an organization like us is involved in this conversation. 
So really, uh, we're recognizing that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN organized panel of scientists all over the world, um, have discussed for the last couple of years about limiting global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. And that in this limitation, there are still opportunities as we reach 2 degrees for catastrophic climate um, events. And so this recognition that we have to keep warming low below the 1.5 area, although it looks more recently like we have potential to overshoot 1.5, um, to recognize that we have to keep this level low um, in order to stave off the worst of climate disaster. And the climate disasters that we've already been experiencing for the past couple of decades have just continued to increase in magnitude. And so uh, in order to do that, there's this recognition that we have to address both uh, current emissions as well as legacy emissions. And so reaching net zero is both a two-pronged kind of exercise where we have to work on mitigating um, those current emissions. And for NWF, our focus is largely on the industrial sector, um, as well as recognizing the legacy emissions that have been in the atmosphere um, since the Industrial Revolution because our carbon cycle has been overwhelmed. The natural carbon cycle has been overwhelmed. And so there are multiple ways to do this, but looking at both carbon capture as a strategy, as well as carbon removal as another pathway for addressing legacy emissions um, is what has to be deployed in order for us to remove the more than 40 gigatons of CO2 that we emit as a planet per year. So these technologies have been developed and are currently being deployed. And as Will said, what we're concerned with for the, uh, for the presentation that we're giving today is mostly about what happens to that CO2 when it's captured. So there is a span of utilization, a spectrum from short-lived products and goods all the way to long-lived permanent. So short-lived products and goods that might be more familiar to folks are things like the food and beverage industry. Uh, I'm a big fan of sparkling water personally and, and carbonated drinks. So thinking about how CO2 is used in those processes um, is a short-lived objective for CO2. So that CO2 will be emitted back into the atmosphere on a very short time scale usually. Then looking towards longer lived um, carbon materials, thinking things like cement and concrete um, are opportunities for us to lock away that CO2 for, um, for a long time, for centuries, up to thousands of years. But the objective for storing the most carbon away that we can is going to be geologic storage. And so uh, this method was, was chosen as a way to uh, to lock away carbon permanently because hydrocarbons are already known to be sealed in geologic formations. So thinking about fossil fuels, the oil and gas that we're used to, all of those have been locked away for, for hundreds of thousands of years in a geologic formation. So the idea that we are going back to sort of this, um, this familiarity of locking away hydrocarbon in the subsurface is um, is what we would really like to focus on today. And a lot of this has been really um, incentivized by the passage of federal initiatives like um, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, or the IRA and encouraging these capture and carbon removal projects to happen as well as incentivizing geologic storage as a part of that. So uh, as Will said, this power typically is housed within the EPA to permit class six wells, the type of well that is needed to do geologic storage. Um, and so at EPA, uh, the number of, of applications has increased significantly as we've started to see these policies um, rolling out and moving forward. Previously, there was no way to, um, there was no incentive for storing CO2 underground, uh, except for enhanced oil recovery, where the CO2 would be used to push out the dredges, last dredges of oil in a depleted oil well. So we knew what the price on oil was, but because there was no price on carbon, there wasn't really an equivalent. And so now with the passage of, um, of the updated rules in IRA and with Bill, we're seeing that now there is an incentive from the federal government for storing uh, CO2 in geologic formations. And so as of March uh, 2024, there's about 44 projects in the EPA tracker um, that I recommend anyone on this talk to go take a look at. Um, EPA is really trying to get at transparency in their process with this track. Tracker, and I think it's somewhere around 130 wells individually. So next slide.
So I also just want to briefly go over the mechanics of geologic storage uh, before I turn it over to Jake to talk about the policy perspective. Um, so we're thinking here about how geologic storage actually works. So CO2 is pressurized um, into its supercritical form. So it's somewhere between a liquid and a gas. And then it's injected into porous rock formations below 3,000 feet. So most of the time, it's up to about two miles uh, below the surface where, um, where the CO2 is being injected in its supercritical form. So this is typically below where we normally would see oil wells. And most importantly, it's below underground sources of drinking water. And so this is really what the objective of the class six primacy program was about at EPA um, or the, the well permitting program um, as a whole was to protect underground sources of drinking water. So that's a big part of the safety that uh, EPA is looking for when they're permitting these wells. And I'll let Jake get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but groundwater aquifers are usually about 100 to 1,000 feet deep um, in, in the subsurface when you measure down from the surface. So we're thinking very deep um, injection of, of the CO2. And there's uh, three different ways that that CO2 can be injected and trapped permanently. So the first way is um, identified in the top image on the far right. So it's known as buoyant or structural trapping. It might be the trapping mechanism that many of us um, that are familiar with geologic storage are familiar with. And so the idea is that um, there is pore space uh, that the supercritical fluid will be injected into um, and the plume will spread, but it is prevented from migrating upward by a layer of low permeability rock, also known as the cap rock. So it's uh, also what's identified as the seal in this picture. So CO2 um, after uh, being pressurized is, is more buoyant than other fluids that will be in, uh, in the pore space. And so it has a tendency to want to migrate upwards, hence the, hence the role of this cap rock that is spread over um, the area. So this is part of trying to characterize the area of injection to make sure that there is a low permeability rock um, that will seal that CO2 away permanently so, um, so as not to worry about the CO2 migrating upward through other geologic formations and and, um, and potentially back up to the surface. The other uh, way of trapping is residual trapping. So the second picture, so this is a bit similar to, um, to natural gas. You know, you could think water in a sponge. This idea that the injected CO2 as it spreads out in a plume um, will leave some CO2 behind between pores. So that CO2 will be held in place uh, by the surface tension and the pore spaces um, as the CO2 continues to, to migrate and spread out. So the cap rock is, is present in all of these examples, um, but really thinking about how that CO2 is going to be trapped residually in the pore space um, and then has another layer of cap rock on top of it. Um, and so the last way is mineral trapping. Um, and so this requires a specific type of rock um, to be present in the, in the geologic formation. So CO2 dissolved water is injected in the subsurface where that CO2 uh, dissolved water will interact with the rocks and minerals that are there, um, typically ultramafic rocks. Um, will uh, allow it to form a solid carbonate. And so uh, companies like CarbFix, the Icelandic company that does mineralization of CO2 um, is uses this technique. And so they're able to create solid rock on about a two year time scale. Um, and so that's a much faster time scale compared to uh, the normal kind of geologic uh, time scale that we're used to. So the CO2 eventually will become um, mineralized, but the mineral trapping with specific types of rocks um, does so on a faster time scale. So um, it's a little bit less reliant on that cap rock model. Um, and there are typically fewer long term leakage concerns because the CO2 is formed in the solid rock. So, uh, you know, in the characterization of finding where exactly a well should be located, uh, we're looking for saline aquifers, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, for example, because those are areas that have already been tapped where we're aware that there's abundant pore space and then mafic and ultramafic rocks. Um, and so then monitoring and transparent reporting is a part of this from start to finish. Um, so this goes as far as the characterization of the injection site, looking at seismic activity during um, injection using sensors um, that are also placed in, um, in the pipeline and at the injection site. And then um, also monitoring the plume once injection is done, uh, monitoring the CO2 plume as it moves throughout the porous um, space. And so um, this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about geologic storage. Um, and I will turn it over to Jake to talk a little bit more about the policy. Lovely, thank you, Simone. Uh, I think that was a really excellent overview of, of the storage part and uh, the necessity of carbon management. Uh, 
let's move into the permitting aspect and the policy aspect, <clears throat> starting with the EPA. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, administers the Underground Injection Control, or the UIC program, whereby it sets regulatory standards and processes applications for underground wells with the goal of preventing the contamination of the underground sources of drinking water, as you said. This happens under the Safe Drinking Water Act. The UIC program comes into play whenever we are talking about putting fluids underground for storage or disposal, and it, it encompasses the permit all the way from the permitting and the construction part of the site to its operation and eventual closure. Now, historically, there have been five different types or classes of underground wells, including uh, class one wells, industrial and municipal waste, class two oil and gas, class three solution mining, class four shallow hazardous and radioactive waste, class five non-hazardous. And in 2010, EPA established a sixth class of wells for geological sequestration of CO2. And the EPA continues to hold responsibility for regulating these wells across most states, tribes, and territories. Now, a class six well application, if a project wants to uh, drill one of these wells, includes uh, a substantial array of information ab about said proposed well, including the following. Uh, an in-depth characterization of site geology, uh, a corrective action preparedness plan in case there are un any unexpected consequences of injection, a financial responsibility statement, a pre-operational testing plan, and a set of proposals for the construction schematics, the operating conditions, the site monitoring, plugging of wells, and eventual site closure. Applicants must also detail an emergency and remedial response plan for their class six well to protect any underground sources of drinking water from contamination in the event uh, of an unexpe unexpected uh, change to the well. Now, when we talk about primacy, what is primacy? How does one get it? With the passage of important carbon management and carbon storage provisions in the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, the number of class six permits at EPA has grown significantly, as Simone said earlier. Uh, there are around 169 pending applications across 58 projects in November of 2023. Uh, there are now 130 wells across 44 projects, as Simone mentioned, uh, as of mid-March, because uh, one third of the previous uh, applications were for the state of Louisiana, which has now been granted state primacy. Permitting class six wells is very time and resource intensive, involving careful site characterizations and extensive modeling. So this process from the initial application to full approval by EPA or by a state body with the class six well program primacy uh, can take around two years and sometimes longer. This waiting period is often noted as a source of frustration by uh, those wishing to quickly take advantage of federal incentives like 45Q um, and is something that uh, is kind of pushing the primacy program forward. To ease the pressure on the federal government, uh, EPA Administrator Michael Regan has encouraged states, tribes, and territories to apply for primary enforcement responsibility, also known as primacy, over the UIC Class 6 program, so long as they can administer this program responsibly. Um, in response, some states have applied for primacy over the UIC Class 6 well program, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what is it required in that application. What does it take for an entity to gain control over the ability to permit Class 6 wells? What is a primary seat application? And for this application, applicants must meet or exceed EPA's UIC requirements. This is a very important part. The state, tribal, or territorial primacy program is not allowed to be less rigorous than the federal EPA's program. This includes having the appropriate regulations and penalty enforcement capabilities. It also, in a primacy application, includes a description of what the program will look like at the state level. Uh, an endorsement from the state's governor and attorney general are necessary. Also included is a, a memorandum of, on, of agreement between the state government and the EPA outlining uh, responsibilities and timelines for uh, how primacy will be gauged moving into the future. And finally, some documents demonstrating a public participation process for uh, Class 6 wells in that state. Who has primacy? Three states have primacy currently, as we sit here today. 
Uh, they are North Dakota, Wyoming, and Louisiana. And at least four states are in various stages of playing for primacy, including Texas, West Virginia, Arizona, and Colorado. Uh, there could perhaps be more, but this is uh, the publicly available information that I was able to gather for this presentation. <clears throat> For both North Dakota and Wyoming, successfully applying for primacy was a lengthy process. Uh, North Dakota applied in 2013 and waited until 2018 for its approval, while Wyoming's official application in 2019 was preceded by years of dialogue with EPA's Region 8, which streamlined final approval in 2020. Uh, in October of 2021, North Dakota became the first state to issue a class six well permit uh, at the state federal or at the state tribal or territorial level below the EPA. Uh, and this was for a permit for captured CO2 uh, that would be sequestered from an ethanol production facility uh, in the state. And they followed that up with a second permit for uh, a coal fired power plant in January of 2022. Uh, this power plant's class six well application time at the state level totaled only eight months. And this is substantially less than the federal EPA's expected application period of, of two years. So you might understand why, uh, as a project developer requesting these wells, uh, eight months is more attractive to you than two years. Wyoming approved its first Class 6 well permits in December of 2023, three years after being granted state primacy. Uh, and finally, Louisiana is the most recent state to be granted primacy. EPA awarded uh, that Primacy over Class 6 wells in Louisiana in December of 2023, and we'll have more to say on Louisiana here soon. <clears throat> but first, I want to talk about some polling that uh, we did at National Wildlife Federation with our partners at Data for Progress on uh, what do folks think about uh, carbon storage, specifically in Louisiana and Colorado. Uh, after reading a two-sentence explainer on the issue, voters in Louisiana were divided ultimately with 46% of respondents in favor of state authority and 43% in favor of federal authority. In Louisiana, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality was seen as the most trusted body to oversee carbon storage in the state. Um, this polling was conducted in September of 2023 before EPA reached a final decision on, Louis on Louisiana's primacy application and ultimately the Department of Natural Resources, the Louisiana DNR, is the body in Louisiana tasked with overseeing its Class 6 well program. Uh, as you can see here, the DEQ polled as the most trusted body with EPA and DNR polling slightly behind. 51% of voters in Colorado supported state primacy over carbon storage, while 41% supported continued federal authority. In Colorado, the federal EPA was seen as the most trusted body to oversee carbon storage. However, taken together, Colorado state agencies did poll higher at 51% than the federal EPA, if you take into account the Colorado DNR, combined with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission. In both states, voters also expressed an overwhelming desire for project developers to consult with local communities in determining site locations, engaging community members in workshops, guaranteeing local project benefits, and ensuring community participation and decision-making at key points in a project. Uh, this was an overwhelming finding of our polling, and I direct you to the Data for Progress website and the National Wildlife Federation website to see uh, more in-depth numbers on this polling. Additionally, it is also important to note that while polling can certainly be very useful, it does not necessarily capture all of the qualitative dimensions of an issue like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, EPA received more than 40,000 comments on Louisiana's primacy application, uh, which was significantly more than Wyoming or North Dakota. And each of these comments kind of represents feedback to EPA that is, is difficult to measure with polls. Um, so as always, take, take numbers like this with a grain of salt. <clears throat> it's important when we talk about primacy to talk about some qualms and misgivings uh, about this issue. More than a few folks have misgivings about the prospect of giving certain states primacy over carbon storage. <clears throat> Wyoming and North Dakota are both substantial fossil fuel producing states, and uh, their primacy bids were championed by this industry. 
So the Wyoming Petroleum, Petroleum Association uh, celebrated that state's uh, bid for and success with primacy. North Dakota's bid was recognized by a coal industry group as, quote, a path forward to ensure the long-term viability of North Dakota's lignite coal and energy generation industries. And in Louisiana, Louisiana's primacy bid was supported by the American Petroleum Institute, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy, and industry groups representing oil, natural gas, and chemicals. Um, in the case of Louisiana, some environmental justice groups, uh, led by the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, responded by penning a letter to the EPA urging them to ultimately deny Louisiana's bid for primacy. Uh, their letter lays out a substantial critique of the state of Louisiana that argues the following. They argue that Louisiana does not have sufficient expertise or staff to carry out the UIC Class 6 pro well program on its own. They argue that some of the proposed environmental regulations were less stringent than the federal requirements, including leaving the public open to cleanup liability. And they argued that the state has, quote, a bad track record of insufficient regulatory enforcement on previous oil and gas wells in Louisiana, and that ultimately allowing primacy under these conditions would undermine federal commitments to environmental justice. Opposition to state primacy in West Virginia and Texas echo similar points. They also charge that state agencies lack the sufficient capacity, uh, and by capacity we mean uh, expertise, staff, funding, to successfully administer the permitting program and, and ultimately have uh, poor track records or at least spotty track records of upholding environmental protections in the face of industry violations. Now, we should be clear, many of these criticisms are right on the mark. While a given state's approach to regulatory enforcement is not necessarily a continuation of their past actions, it is very important to recognize that a state government's history has consequences felt at present, and that those who have been neglected or harmed by institutions may have very good reasons for withholding trust. Um, while the EPA should continue to hold states to a high standard, meeting or exceeding all federal requirements for the UIC program in considering primacy bids, states seeking primacy might consider taking restorative action in their own states to build back foregone trust in the communities they serve. With that, we pivot to what might be a pathway for what we're calling responsible primacy. At the National Wildlife Federation, we do believe that a pathway to responsible primacy is possible. Uh, some promising initiatives from the Biden administration on this point bear mentioning here. Uh, in November, 2023, the Biden admin announced a grant program aimed at facilitating more successful state primacy applications. Uh, this program called the UIC Class 6 Grant Program uh, allocated $48 million and available funding equally across 25 interested states and tribes to assist in building their capacity for permitting Class 6 wells. Applicants were asked to write plans that demonstrated how environmental justice and equity considerations would be incorporated into their primacy programs um, and this program offers an opportunity to make environmental justice and public engagement into important pillars of state administration of, car of Class 6 wells in the event that those states move forward with a primacy bid. But as these are only plans, uh, it is important to note here that states still need to take proactive steps in this regard uh, for us to see how environmental justice and equity uh, show up in their programs. Additionally, EPA has set up a publicly available permitting tracker that Simone mentioned earlier, uh, and this is an excellent resource that facilitates visibility into what applications are currently under consideration um, so that folks uh, like us, folks who are maybe living in or near areas that uh, where a well would impact them can see uh, with early notice what's going on and where EPA is at with, with that well. This transparency is something with, that states with primacy ought to emulate as well. Additionally, the US Department of Energy's Regional Technical Assistance Centers have some funding set aside to provide technical and informational assistance to stakeholders involved in CO2 transport and storage, including class six wells. Um, essentially, DOE has some money set aside that uh, folks can tap into to 
better uh, get informed and better facilitate engagement on this issue at the community level. In sum, the Biden administration is ostensibly committed to carbon management that is designed, built, and operated safely and responsibly, and in a way that reflects the best science and commercial practice and responds to the needs and inputs of local communities. It is important that states seeking primacy are at least as committed to these goals, if not more so. And finally, in the case of Louisiana's uh, recently approved primacy application, the EPA worked alongside the state in the creation of its final rule to adopt the environmental justice center paradigm uh, and practices encouraged by the administration. In their final agreement, the state agreed to uh, adopt all EJ elements to scrap. <clears throat> yeah, the state agreed to adopt all EJ requirements recommended by the EPA. While the EPA worked with the Louisiana DNR before approving this, uh, to address specific issues brought up during the public comment period, including uh, concerns such as uh, pollution and overburdened communities and community liability, uh, like we mentioned earlier. Ultimately, the Louisiana DNR and the EPA will have to prove the state's competency and reliability through direct application and enforcement of these principles. Um, but EPA's work with the state of Louisiana as it processed that primacy application and took into account <clears throat> these 40,000 comments uh, is something of, of a model to look toward. In closing, the National Wildlife Federation considers primacy to be part of a responsible carbon management deployment framework if the following hold true. The first um, might be summarized as capacity and expertise. And this is essentially saying the state, tribe, or territory ought to have a sufficient funding, staff capacity, and staff expertise to both facilitate effective permitting for Class 6 wells and enforce penalties in the face of a violation. This includes the appropriate tools and resources for communities to engage, or for the state to engage, but also the intention to hold violators within their jurisdiction accountable. The second might be called restorative and reparative justice. Uh, and for this principle, the state, tribe, or territory ought to take proactive steps to remediate past harms and rebuild lost trust in communities being asked to bear uh, further industrial development for carbon management. This includes an honest reckoning with the ongoing legacies of past injustices perpetrated under the state's watch and a clear demarcation of cleanup uh, liability. Finally, uh, we talk about transparency and engagement. This means that the state, tribe, or territory ought to provide a, a public plan for regulatory enforcement, including clear well monitoring systems, transparent accountability measures, and high standards for commu community engagement. Uh, again, community engagement is extremely popular in the states that we poll and is crucial for aligning with incentives uh, at the federal level, like Justice 40 and the Responsible Carbon Management Initiative. And if tenants like these hold true, then some groups like our affiliate in Louisiana, the Louisiana Wildlife Federation, have found it possible to express conditional support for primacy. In their absence, though, irresponsible primacy may even hold back responsible carbon management more broadly or even harm the active build out of the industry. Uh, so it's important to be thinking about principles for what a responsible primacy would look like. And I'll uh, end it there. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jake and Simone. Uh, so uh, as I said, we'll move to a couple of questions uh, that, that I've been thinking about in terms of this report and then move on to, uh, to audience questions. I guess the first question is, when we think about this, this concept of, of primacy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, federalism, are there other uh, precedents for other kinds of uh, technologies or processes that might provide us with some lessons in terms of moving forward with this, given the fact that we're in a, you know, a pretty incipient state for this. Yeah, thanks for the question, Will. I think that, you know, there's quite a bit to be learned from what we've experienced in the primacy process up until now. So as Jake said, North Dakota and Wyoming were the first two states to get primacy. And since then, they've been able to approve 
applications relatively quickly for class six wells um, that the timeline is you know eight to ten months in some in some cases as opposed to the two to six years uh, that people are spending at EPA waiting for permits to be approved and I think that you know there is a real lesson to be learned from the uh, from the process that Jake really detailed with EPA in Louisiana, that this is a great opportunity to incorporate the feedback that people are getting from communities and, and shows that public comment periods are, are increasingly important when we are starting to deploy this technology that, um, you know, that frankly, we talked a little bit about before this started, that people don't really understand coming to places that are, are relatively near them. And so it's an opportunity for um, for folks to engage. And I think that, you know, there was a question I saw in the Q&A that we can get to later that asked a question about pipelines. And, and it's something that, you know, there is a storied history of pipelines in the United States, um, especially with environmental justice and, um, and tribal groups. And so I think that that is maybe a, a space where there are some learnings that we can take into the primacy conversation about land and about, um, and about places that maybe communities consider to be important, but may not seem important to a developer and, in, and increasingly why community engagement in, in the process is necessary um, when it comes down to the siting. And so we recognize that in uh, in permitting that you need a particular type of geology. So there are some limitations on where you, you can permit, um, but then recognizing that on the surface, there's also a lot of conversation uh, that has to happen. And we're also seeing with the recent um, the recent passage of U.S. Forest Service um, bills that that we're going to start seeing permitting potentially on forest lands or other public lands, and so this is a great opportunity to kind of think about our history with pipelines and our history with any kind of siting infrastructure for the lessons learned as far as um, including community input um, in in trying to move away from things like eminent domain and these kind of uh, state grabs at land or federal grabs at land to make sure that the process is really equitable. And anything to add on that, Jake? Um, no, I would just echo everything Simone said. I think that was perfectly put. Okay. All right. Uh, so you indicate in the report that uh, Louisiana and others have uh, have uh, indicated that they'll pursue uh, environmental justice considerations, civil rights considerations, notions of public engagement uh, in, in their uh, in their process, and uh, and and that's part of the agreement with EPA. But the the cynic in me says that that might be a, a checkbox exercise, uh, and given the, as your report points out, some of these states haven't always carried through in the way that they need to to protect the interests of people in the state, especially vulnerable people. Is there a process for EPA uh, to uh, uh, to monitor? Uh, their operalization of these uh, ideas of environmental justice and civil rights protections and so forth, or do they just say, you've got to do it and, and walk away in the process? How does it work? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I, I think it's a really good question, and I think it's something that's uh, still actively being figured out uh, at, at the federal level and how we want to kind of uh, approach things like industrial build out, things like carbon management with environmental justice in mind. Um, when we when we look at like what levers are available, EPA does uh, have the ability to levy fines and ultimately uh, revoke a primacy uh, designation from a state if it finds that state to not be in compliance any longer. Uh, this is this is good to know. This is good to uh, consider. They call it the comprehensive UIC program evaluation. Um, they do an annual review and they can also be requested to do a review. So if there are communities who are like this state X is not living up to their expectations, we want you federal EPA to come in and take a look. There is a process for that. Uh, getting at your question a little bit more directly, there is not necessarily yet a, uh, a lever in that process to say to, to just point directly at something like environmental justice or community engagement and say they are not doing enough of that and so it needs to be reconsidered the rules might need to be uh to to be taken into account this new paradigm they might need to be adjusted at epa and that would be something we would love to see you know um it's kind of hard to remember sometimes that like justice 40 is like less than three years old and 
and uh, things like responsible carbon management initiative are still being worked out. Um, like things that incorporate environmental justice at the federal level are still in the early days, uh, as as sad and, and kind of depressing as that is. But um, that just means it's it's that much more important to be talking about these things now, and and to be kind of advocating that uh, you know if we do find a state, tribe, or territory to be um, an unworthy or an irresponsible actor of primacy, that we can hold them uh, to account on, on their environmental justice record. Yeah, yeah. I hope I hope it's possible because obviously, if there's a huge backlog of applications at EPA, one wonders if they have uh, the personnel uh, in parallel to be able to adequately monitor what states are doing in this context, right? So I guess uh, time will time will tell. Uh, let me ask you one other question, and then we'll move to the audience questions. Uh, public engagement is a big passion of mine in this context. I was wondering what you think are are critical elements of public engagement in this context, and a specific question. Let's say uh, that the public engagement process yields a conclusion by a community that they just don't want a, a, a CCS uh, project in, in their community. Uh, should they have a right uh, to be able to just veto uh, that, that project? What, what would NWF say? Um, maybe I can I can take this one and start it, and Simone can jump in. Uh, I think that to answer the first part of your question, uh, like what does robust public engagement look like? Uh, there's a lot that we can say on this. Maybe we start with um, having a very early engagement, like an early public comment period that is um, widely known and circulated in the community, um, in both online and, and in-person uh, formats. If you're going to do it in person, you need to make it accessible. So it needs to be like language accessible, time and day accessible. Uh, it needs to be physically accessible. Um, I would say seeking out grassroots opinions and not necessarily just uh, elected leader or grass tops opinions uh, would be a crucial part of public engagement. Um, and making that engagement uh, both robust and sustained over time. So uh, not just talking to folks early on and, and just pretending it, that their opinion can't change as the project develops, it, it likely will, uh, and making it robust in the sense that it's not a an hour-long meeting where you you explain the project for 50 minutes and have 10 minutes of questions. It's, it's an actual two-way dialogue where the community can uh, ask their questions, make their comments, and feel like when you come back to meet them again as a project developer, perhaps, that uh, you've actually taken into account what they've said and made changes. I think that is crucial for building trust in a public engagement process. And if ultimately what, what you're seeking is, is a social license to operate in that community, it's gonna be crucial that, that the community feels like they are a part of and have a stake in that project. Um, one, one more point I'll make before I throw it to Simone is uh, I think we want to be taking community concerns very seriously and validating them when they come up. Um, not everyone's an expert in carbon management. Very few people are, actually. Uh, and so some of those concerns will be uh, maybe uh, mistaken or misguided or potentially not quite on the mark scientifically. Uh, and it is important that we as an industry do not um, kind of start those conversations by correcting them or by making them feel bad about being wrong or anything like that. Um, I think a lot of uh, concerns about environmental issues and about industrial issues come from very real places and that addressing those concerns starts with <laughs> validating that even if they don't have the science right, that their feelings are very valid. Um, and I think uh, starting there is, is very important. Simone. Yeah, I think that, you know, that, that was a great answer, Jake. And, and really that validation, like uh, Jake said, is what we strive towards. As far as, you know, doing all of that process and a no being the answer, um, I think is a, is a question that we're grappling with as an industry. And what does it look like to genuinely want the build out, but also to genuinely want to support communities? In NWF, we really think that our role in the conversation is as an information provider and information broker um, and someone with experts that you can ask questions to. Um, and so we're very supportive of 
self-determination being a part of this process. If a community has all of the information and you know NWF has been a part of helping them find that, and the ultimate answer is no, we don't want this project, NWF really believes that it's on us to respect the community's wishes. Um, you know, something that I'll add to that though is I think that rather than sticking with just the no, it's really important to understand why the no developed why the no evolved to be a no instead of something else, um, rather than bulldozing and saying, okay, well, we got a no, but we're gonna do this anyway, because maybe the no points to issues in the process. Maybe the process wasn't as um, two-way or as engaging as the industry thought it was. Maybe the no results uh, because there isn't a historic trust. Is That's a lot of what we saw in Louisiana when talking to our partners there, um, was that there was a historic distrust of industry and a historic distrust of government, both kind of federal and local. Um, so I think that, you know, there that's where the restorative aspect comes in is maybe we're not at a place where we can have a yes in this relationship right now, but we need to build towards that. And so I think rather than, um, you know, industries just being frustrated with the no, it's more of, well, what can we do? What role can we play? What partnerships can we develop? Like, you know, those with NWF and other advocacy based organizations to understand why the no was a no and try and move it towards a yes, because some Sometimes it is about a lack of information. Sometimes it's about a lack of trust. Um, and sometimes ultimately the community just says no. I think that we saw the process between Wyoming and North Dakota for primacy looked very different than the process in Louisiana. And I think that's evidence that there are going to be places in the United States where carbon management, the entire value chain is more favorable. And those are places where maybe community conversations are, are easier or look different. And I think that maybe those are the places that we should think about targeting when we're talking about the build out of this industry. And maybe in places like Louisiana, there's just a lot more steps that have to happen before they're ready for the project. But I totally understand as somebody working in this field for the last few years and who studied it in graduate school for years prior that, you know, there, there's a sense of urgency that we have, that we have um, as a community that wants to do things for the climate. Uh, but there's a similar sense of urgency in communities to protect themselves. So I think that, you know, validating those concerns like Jake said is a really important step in the process. Um, and you know, if it gets to be a no, we can talk about that if it happens. All right, thanks for that, Simone. All right, let's move to audience questions. And uh, Simone, you referenced the pipeline question. So let's go right there because that's a, that's another big potential choke point when it comes to uh, CCS as, as conveyance issues. So uh, this question's from uh, Peter Hoberg. He says, won't uh, geological storage require pipelines for delivery of the CO2 to the class six wells? Are there part of, uh, are these part of the considerations for primacy? Who will address the environmental justice and community aspects of pipelines? Yeah, so that's a great question and something that we talk about at NWF um, when it comes to co-location of projects. So this is a little bit easier when you're talking about CDR, where it's a new project, it has the ability for the most part to be built anywhere if you're thinking about things like DAC, um, rather than CCS, where the project is you know based on the industrial component. So in a case of CDR, like direct air capture, um, you would want to co-locate that, you'd want to build it where the storage exists. So that's one of the things that we talk about really frequently at NWF because that would minimize the, the need for pipelines to, to occur to move that CO2 from point A to point B. Um, in a case of a, a CCS project where maybe you're taking, you're capturing CO2 from a steel mill, for example, um, you know, you have to go to where the industry is. And the industry is not necessarily always by a favorable geology. So in that case, you would need a pipeline in order to transport it from point A to point B where you would be doing injection. So I think there are, are opportunities Opportunities, especially for new projects to reduce the amount of pipelines that um, that have to be required as a part of the project, but the pipelines are not a part of the primacy uh, project as far as as far as injecting the CO2 into the subsurface. That's more of the project developers relationship with the community and having those conversations. Um, and so really it is on the on the developer to try and find um, opportunities to minimize the necessity of pipelines and have conversations where there are going to be pipelines. Um, some of the hope a little bit is that CO2 pipelines are very expensive as far as uh, the whole kind of pipeline spectrum goes. So the fewer miles that you can run a CO2 pipeline, the better it is financially as a choice. So I think that we're also going to see project developers really trying to make those smart decisions, if not for community purposes, for financial reasons, um, because it is, 
it is a high cost. Um, and in addition, uh, there's a lot of conversation about uh, repurposing rights of way that already exist. And so we have a robust pipeline network of lots of different kinds of pipelines in the United States. CO2 is just a facet of that. There's about five, 6,000 miles of CO2 pipeline um, in the country right now, mostly in the Western Rockies and some in the, um, in the Gulf South. Um, but really, there is a really intricate network of natural gas pipelines across the country. So trying to repurpose those rights of way to include CO2 pipelines or have CO2 replace natural gas um, in the right of way is definitely an opportunity to take areas where there's already existing um, pipeline infrastructure and use it so you're not trying to carve out new areas for pipeline infrastructure. But definitely a really tense part of the issue for sure, especially like I said with the U.S.'s history with eminent domain um, and land grabs. So really pipeline operators have to be very strategic um, in how they think about their uh, think about deploying this for geologic storage. And so one of the ways to do it, I think, is to co-locate where you can. Yeah, yeah. I hope I hope they start uh, getting more creative in this context, right? I think I think the natural inclination has been to simply uh, bulldoze through the process, and we've seen them get burnt in, even in places like North Dakota and Iowa recently, right? So it, it, it's definitely an interesting aspect of this. Uh, uh, so uh, next question uh, for. Uh, and this is from L. Leonard, uh, for ultramafic uh, carbonate formation, are the carbonates formed expected to sink down to the bottom of the ocean? Uh, have there been any studies focused on the seabed before carbofix? This may be beyond your uh it, it, well, it's beyond the scope of your report, but I don't yeah. know if it's beyond the Kennedy. I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Will. And, and you know, thanks for that question in the audience. So um, so Carfix is actually doing terrestrial injection in Iceland um, because Iceland largely was a volcanic formation. So it's made up largely of basaltic rock, which is a type of that ultramafic rock. Um, so there's lots of basalt basaltic rock um, all over the world, but in certain places in the United States, um, like Northern California, for example, has a lot of basalts. Um, and so they're doing ter terrestrial injection actually in Iceland, um, doing that, that water combined with CO2, dissolved CO2 um, to create more rock. In the case of the seabed, we've actually seen examples um, like Sleipnir, which was a Norwegian CCS project that started in 1996, I think. And they've been sequestering under the seabed since 1996, since the project started. And it's really considered a successful project in terms of CCS deployment across the globe. It was a natural gas capture project. And so um, in the same sense of injection as terrestrial, this is uh, the injection would be miles below the seabed. So you still are looking for those ideal geologic formations, whether saline aquifers or in the case of mineralization, you're looking for basaltic rock at that level. So the seabed is still miles above where you would be injecting. And so ultimately that uh, that denser CO2 plume um, when injected into those mafic or ultramafic formations would still form solid rock and they would be miles below the seabed. So you wouldn't have a chance of them interacting. And even in the case of Slipnir, it was a um, it was a, a shallow version um, of that. So it wasn't miles. I think that it was maybe several, several thousand uh several thousand meters deep um, or hundreds of meters deep um, and were they were still able to do it really successfully and there was a lot of other monitoring MRV that went into it um, including the, like the 3D seismic that they were doing um, and testing to make sure that there were no kind of uh, negative impacts of them doing it in the seabed but there's opportunities in the U.S. to do offshore sequestration similarly um, like we see in the Gulf South with offshore oil drilling it's a lot of the same type of geology that you would be looking at um, especially if they there's depleted oil and gas wells in the area, then we know that that pore space is available for CO2. So it's not something that is a robust conversation happening in the United States right now, but it's definitely likely to become more robust. Okay, uh, next question uh, from uh, uh, Carl Dance. Uh, is there a way to learn which groups are behind the current efforts to secure state primacy? Uh, he said he's interested particularly in the process in Oregon. Um, as far as I know, there's not like one uh, centrally located node that you can kind of go to and see like where everyone's at because these these things happen at the state level and the states aren't fully coordinating on them. Uh, as far as knowing which state, like if Oregon is in the process, um, 
the UIC Classics grant program that I mentioned earlier that uh, allocated 48 million uh, at the end of 2023 across 25 different uh, states, tribes, and territories, that might be a good place to start. I mean, those 25 states, tribes, and territories are interested enough to go ask the federal government for 2 million apiece. So um, not all of them, I don't think will end up uh, wanting or uh, getting primacy, but uh, they've, they've done that first step. So um, maybe start there and see if Oregon's on that list. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start, um, Jake. And then the other thing I would just say is looking at the EPA UIC website, um, they typically have put people or people states um, that are really close to the end of the application process and back and forth with EPA. So um, I think that uh, Texas and uh, New Mexico are on there and Michigan was for class two primacy, but class six primacy, they typically will list on the website what states are in the process of engaging with EPA and where they are um, if they have started engaging. And so it's, um, it's not always the best metric of trying to understand where states are. Like Jake said, there's a lot of coordination that's going on between EPA and at the state level, but definitely taking a look at the grant program to get kind of understanding of who is interested in the process is a great way to start. Okay, uh, next question from uh, Joseph K. Are the applications for class six wells new bores or class twos being converted to class six? If the latter, the locations are already predetermined, so hard to do environmental justice. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one that I'm actually not sure about the answer. I think that um, most of the primacy cases for class six are starting with a class six well application. As far as a class two becoming a class six, I'm not really sure what the process for that would be um, as far as having whether that goes to the state or whether that goes to EPA. I think it depends too on if the state has primacy already for class two, um, since they're, they would be the ones issuing the permits for it. But totally right, if, if the class two becoming a class six um, is changing, it, it, those, those wells are already in existence. But I think while the, the environmental justice aspect might be a little bit more difficult since the well location has already been decided, it is a good opportunity to have a conversation with the community and educate them about how it's changing and how it's updating and what it might be for. So if you're talking class two and oil um, and EOR and you're moving to just pure geologic storage, um, I think that there's a great story there to talk about a transition away from, um, from the fossil industry and talk about why we're doing geologic storage um, and why it's necessary for part of the climate. Um, still with the well changing the type of permit, there might be an open comment op opportunity or period for that um, that allows people to, to have a conversation. So while the location, like you said, has already been decided, I still think it's a good opportunity for engaging with the surrounding community about what the change is. All right. Um... Uh, next question uh, is a, uh, let's see, uh, methodological question from uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, the polling question on primacy doesn't clarify that state rules must be as rigorous as the EPA. Was this clarified uh, elsewhere in the, in the polling? I might have to go back and check on that. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, that might influence those numbers. So, uh, Simone, do you remember? I don't think that it was necessarily explained. I think it was just as simple as EPA has the ability and can grant the ability at the state. But I agree, um, you know, another round of questioning or polls moving forward with different states, um, it would be good to clarify that, you know, it would have to be as robust, if not more robust than the EPA program could, could change opinions. But I think that quite a bit of what we did see was just a general lack of trust of, of the state. So I'm, I'm not sure how much informing them um, of that would change, would uh, change the opinion, but definitely a good flag for moving forward. Okay. Um, Time for last one last question uh, from Peter Holberg. Uh, what's the status of California's primacy application? If you know, is it in process? Do you know if California's? I don't actually I... know anything about California. I don't know if you <laughs> did, Jake. If you came across it at all. Um, oh, I don't want to repeat rumors. Uh, I think I re I think I read somewhere that California wasn't interested in primacy, even though it has uh, a lot of wells permitting uh, or in pending at EPA yeah. right now. Um, 
I can't remember what the source was there. So um, yeah, I will I say do, I also don't know. Yeah, I do. I do know that they have some wells being permitted at the EPA level, but I'm not sure um, either about the primacy question. Okay. All right. So uh, we have reached the top of the clock, uh, and uh, we are uh, going to close out this uh, episode. I'd like to once again uh, thank our guests today, uh, uh, Simone Stewart and Jake Farrell from NWF, for uh, uh, sharing uh, the results from this report and 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 answering questions. And as always, I thank our audience for the the perceptive questions. So. I hope you'll uh, join us again in a couple of weeks. Uh, our next episode will focus on uh, the new uh, trade association that's been uh, created to focus on enhanced rock weathering uh, with an emphasis on how this might help facilitate uh, further uh, market penetration of enhanced rock weathering in, in the European uh, Union. So uh, please come back. And once again, thanks to everyone. And with that, I will say goodbye. Thanks, Will.